tackle the Word of God today? Well, last week was so fun. It was so different the way the Lord just orchestrated that service where we started out with sermon and ended in worship. That was just totally different, wasn't it? But that was, you know, we don't look at methodology. What we hear is try to hear from the Spirit of God of what He wants in a day in a service. And sometimes He throws wrenches according to our plans because it's His plan. And so the wrench is actually us, not what He puts in our place. But I've been, uh, I was hoping to start this series last week. The Lord had a different plan. This series is called Lessons from Jericho, and it is built on engaging the enemy on God's terms, not our own, right? How many of this, uh, the last couple, two, three days can say, I really have felt like I'm in a, a spiritual battle with some really hefty attacks? Now, I don't mean the kind of attack that says, you know, my knee's just been hurting more lately because, I don't know, it must be the devil. No, it's your knee. <laughs> but I'm talking about that sense of <clears throat> dread or, or fear or anger or anxiety of some sort or just obstacles that have been just like you're saying, where is this coming from? How many have had that? Those are, those are, there's a reason for this. Um, when we stood up and declared the direction, I believe this, and you might think I'm crazy, but when we stood up and declared the direction that we were going to go in, uh, in our church, in our Freedom Church here, in dealing with life-controlling issues, literally demonic issues, uh, it, deliverance issues, really comes down to that in the purest form. When we made that clear, and we do need to make those things clear, who does not like that? Now, I'm not asking you which one of you don't like that, but I'm saying, who, who doesn't like that? The enemy, the principalities and the powers of the air hear that. They see that. They see preemptively what's coming if we will just believe the Lord. They see preemptively that they're going to lose citizens. They're going to have casualties in their kingdom. I love that. For us, yes. We're going to be bringing life to dead people. But for the kingdom of darkness, that's a casualty. And they don't want to lose their, their dead people. We were all dead in our sins and trespasses. But we heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and we were delivered. Hallelujah. All right, so when we made that statement, when we made that, as the Lord began to reveal the direction that we were to go with this thing, and I started sharing it with you, and, and it seemed like you just got really excited. Well, guess what? Who said that? Here we go. Like, bring it on. Really, truly, we, ha we are finding things coming against us that we, from directions that, why? Where is that coming from? Well, there, that's the reason. So, lessons from Jericho. Engaging the enemy on his terms, uh, on God's terms. And, and today we're going to, not, not the enemy's terms, on God's terms. Today we're going to be looking at the first steps for taking the city. When, I'm, when I say that, once again, we are not going to win St. Joseph for Jesus Christ. Oh, pastor, that's a terrible thing to say. No, we're not called to win the city. If that happens, praise God. What we are called to do is win souls and deliver souls. And if it stacks up the way it could stack up, then yeah, we could win a city. But that our calling is one by one discipling people out of the kingdom of darkness and out of bondages into the kingdom of his dear son. And we'll do that until the Lord says, you're done. Right? And everybody has a part in some way, some form. And they're going to look different. It doesn't matter. We're a team. Go team. Right? <laughs> Put our hands. Yay, team. We're a team. And, and the team has different functions all around. But working together, the team, in the name of Jesus, is powerful and strong 
and the walls of Jericho cannot stand against the team when it engages in the battle according to God's terms, not our terms. So everything we're going to look at in this series called Lessons from Jericho is going to be, it's going to start out and be predicated by this very fact that we know the Lord's will. The Lord's will for Freedom Church is to share freedom in Jesus with everyone. That's the Lord's will for our church. It's simply put, we don't have anything fancy. It doesn't need to be pretty. We're called to share freedom in Jesus with everyone. That's the Lord's will. And so it's predicated on that because that's the design that God has given us, and he's going to bring us into that fullness if we will trust and begin to tear down strongholds according to his design and not ours. So that principle not only holds for Freedom Church, listen to this, it holds for you personally. You can know God's will, the design that he has for your life. Yeah. Now, yes, there are moments when you're stepping along and you're saying, uh, which way do I go? <laughs> and sometimes you don't know and, and you need to stop and review and pray, seek counsel or whatever before you do this or that. But you can set your life in the direction that the Lord wants you to go right off the bat, right off the bat. And in that, you will end up breaking and tearing down strongholds in your own life. Now, some of you raised your hands. Many of you raised your hands, and you feel like, man, there's stuff coming against me because I know I'm on the right track. Uh, but we've got to understand what God's will is for our life. Now, here are a few things. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture, and uh, it's not going to be on the screen because I added this. <laughs> That's okay. The Lord expands things. I want, as we start into this lessons of Jericho, we've got to start out with the very first chapter in Joshua. If you want to open there, you can. Verse 1 starts out this way. It says this. This is Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, quote, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, get up, <laughs> go over this Jordan, you and all this people. And there's about two million people. They're on the other side of the Jordan River. They've been wandering in the desert for 40 years, right? Round and round and round they go, all right? But now it's time to cross over. And so the Lord says this into the land that I am giving to them, the people, to the people of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot will tread, I will give to you. Just as I promised Moses. Moses did not get to fulfill God's promise. Can anybody remember why? Huh? Because the second time Israel complained about not having water, God told Moses, the first time God told him, strike the rock. But the second time he said, speak to this rock and it will gush forth with water. But Moses got royally ticked off. Right? He got angry with the people because they were a bunch of big, fat babies complaining about everything. And he got tired of it. And he took the rod that he had in his hand, and basically he said this paraphrase, do I have to show you another miracle? Can you say with me, oh no. And <laughs> he struck the rock with that rod. It was such a spiritual moment. There was such spiritual force in what he did that the rock, and it's a huge rock, it, you can see it on on YouTube, the, the Sinai is actually, this rock is actually in part of Saudi Arabia. It's not in where they say Sinai is. But that rock was so huge, it's a huge boulder, it literally split in two, and water gushed out of it and became a river. And God said, I told you to speak to the rock. 
I'm not going to share my glory with you in your anger. And because of this, you have nullified the promise. You're not going to enter into the land. He gave him this promise, though, I will let you see the land. So Moses was taken up on the mountain across the Jordan, Pisgah, and he looked out. He was able to look out and see the promised land, but he was not allowed to go in. Wow. I don't know where that came from. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not a good thing to upset God by claiming his go- glory. Don't do that. But the promise is made to Joshua. So jo- listen to this. Joshua now knows the direction and God's will, and he's received the promise. What is God's will? Get up, take this people, cross the river, and go into the land, and everywhere you set your foot, I'm going to give to this people. What is our promise? What is our call? Share freedom in Jesus with everyone. That's our call. So we're going to cross the river, and we're crossing the river, and we're saying this is God's will for us as a church, but in your own life there are rivers, and there are strongholds that need to be broken, rivers that need to be crossed. You need to hear God's will for you. And so I have some elements, real quickly, that, uh, that spell out what God's will for you is. First of all, we can know. Say that with me. We can know. This is right off the bat. Six things, really, cl- really quick. We can know the Lord's will for salvation. Okay, so we know it's the Lord's will that we're saved. Praise God. And it's not God's will that any should perish. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises, as some count slowness, but He's patient toward you, not willing, wishing, however you want to say it, that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it's God's will that we share the good news of Jesus Christ, of salvation, with everyone. Because that's the initial stage of freedom. Everything is broken at that point. Everything is broken. Listen. If I don't get halfway through this message today, guess what? There's next week. Every, every stronghold in our life has an answer. It begins with salvation. At that moment, all the old, say it with me, all the old is gone and everything becomes brand new. Listen closely. That means bondages of generational sin are broken at salvation. But you can go back to those bondages after salvation. That's where many people fail and get ruined. Because they don't allow the new life in Christ to flourish. They don't quickly be filled with the Holy Spirit. They don't get baptized in the Holy Spirit and gain some new power and strength and start this new trajectory. And so it's easy to go back, and Paul says it this way, back to the lusts of our youth or early life. That's what he's talking about, our early life before Christ. Do you follow? We know the Lord's will for us is to be saved, and the Lord's will is that all should come to repentance. It was the Lord's will for Moses to go into the land of promise, but he didn't because he broke something. We don't want to break what God is calling us to do because we want some glory or we want to look like some pretty thing or make ourselves desirable to the world. That's not what a church should do. The church should be standing in the power of the Holy Spirit, declaring the word of Jesus Christ and offering freedom in Christ, in Jesus, for everyone. And sometimes that makes people mad. Second, it involves the fact that we can know the Lord's will for our obedience. Also in 2 Peter, the the next few verses, 10 Verses 10 through 14, listen to this. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved in the earth, and the works that are done in it will be exposed. That's a spiritual thing that will happen that's going to expose the works on the earth. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Whoa, 
back up the wagon. We can know the Lord's will when it comes to our obedience to the principles of the Word of God. Why? Because we're waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. This really sounds like, a man, this is really going to be bad. Yes, it's going to be bad, but not for us. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Hallelujah. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, meaning peace with Christ. So what does that mean? That means that before we can go into a, a stronghold and take it, we've, we need to be set up understanding that it is our responsibility to obey the principles of Christ, even if, you know, even if our flesh kind of wants to do this little thing over here or, you know. We're convicted in heart, but we don't listen to that. You know what happens after a little while? Our hearts become calloused and hardened to what he's speaking to us, and we don't hear him. And so we think we basically think, well, God's okay with what I'm doing. No, he's not. And I've had to have, he is. I can't tell you the times that he has had to thump me on the side of the head, spiritually speaking, sometimes physically. (laughs) And say, I love you. Knock it off. Stop thinking that way. I was, I was, can I give you a little testimony? I was, I don't tell you why or anything. Is it? I was so angry yesterday. I was so angry about something that took place. And I, I, you know, I was, I, I went up from my office. My office is in my dungeon. <laughs> I left the dungeon and I went up. Jean was working in the, in the kitchen doing, I don't know, canning or something. And, and she's looking at me. She said, what in the matter what is the matter with you? Two days before that, I'd been stung by a bee and had a fat lip and it looked really terrible. I can show you pictures later. She asked me that then. What happened to you? But this wasn't, I was shaking. I was so angry. And I, I don't like, I said, honey, I am so mad right now, and I don't like this. I don't like this feeling. I don't want to step over the bounds, because the Lord says, be angry and sin not. And I was at the point of, oh, you know what I'm talking about. Because someone uh, of my history and, and my size and my build and everything, if I... If, if I lose control, I can hurt something <laughs> or myself, right? At 62, it's more like myself than anything else. But you understand what I'm saying? The anger was there. And, and, and I said, I have not been this angry in a very long time. And she said, I remember the last time you were this angry. And it was righteous. I was so angry that this was in South America. I, I, We were hindered in a community. The enemy so hindered us that in front of probably 300 elite Colombian military men, fully armed, fully engaged, helicoptering in to this city, and we were blocked from doing God's will. I was so angry. This is really stupid. I was so angry. I had four Colombians with me in the car. And I stopped the car right in front of the mayor's mansion where all these elite military were and helicopters. I mean, it was an invasion of the military against a drug cartel, but it, everything was blocking what we were to do there. And I got out of my car and I looked at them. They, you know, they weren't from here to Heather from me right here. And I, you know, I, I, I cursed them. Not in Jesus' name, I didn't use curse words, but I, I declared the judgment where the Lord said, if they don't receive you in a community, wipe the dust off your feet and go to the next place. And I said, you have been given the opportunity to hear the word of God and the message of the gospel. And the Colombians in the car were saying, translated, it goes something like this. Oh my God, Brother Jimmy, what are you doing? We're all going to die. 
die. You know, and all their voices were raised up to the level of Muppets. And it was just, oh, we're all going to die. But I got out of the car and I said this to him. And then I reached down and I wiped the dust off my feet and said, the judgment is on you. And I got back in my car and they opened the roadblock. And we got out of Dodge. And I was angry, but it was righteous anger. And I was that way yesterday. And the Lord had to correct me and say, back up. Strongholds are broken when you engage the enemy according to my terms, Mr. Jimmy, not your terms. <laughs> you understand? I'm not going to get to my sermon today. We know God's will, and sometimes God's will is you need to get this right in your life before you can go forward to fulfill my design for your life. How many have been there? 17 of you. Praise God. And so all I can do is encourage you to get it right. If something's not lined up in your life according to the word of God, do not take the risk of the Lord saying, I have offered this to you, but you've chosen. I'm not talking about your salvation. I'm talking about growing in Christ. Grow. Number three, <laughs> we know the Lord's will in assembling together, don't we? Forsake not, this is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, and do not, as is the custom of some, forsake the assembling of yourself together, especially as you see that day approaching. I don't know about you. Some of you don't want to look at it. Some You don't want to think about it because your life already has so many rocks in it that you're stumbling over rocks and you're thinking, man, life can't get any worse. Well, it, it can get much better in Christ Jesus if you'll just give him your life in a full way. But trouble is on the horizon. It's growing. And if you don't want to see it, it's still going to reach up and it's going to bite you. I'm not saying that for gloom and doom. I'm saying, hear the truth. The truth of the word of God says, before Jesus comes back for his church, this is going to get really, really bad. I came to church today to be encouraged. Thank God, you're in the right place. <laughs> because we are more than overcomers. And you only overcome when there is a, a, a something to overcome. You only overcome, you only live the light, you only break through the stronghold when there's a stronghold or a storm or a rocky sea or something bad and that's the only time you're going to get victory because if everything is good, there's no point. <laughs> but now we're to the time where the Lord is, I hope no one's offended. Please don't be offended by this. But the Lord is, is allowing the, the current climate of this world, I don't mean weather, <laughs> this, <laughs> the philosophies of the world, the, the, the darkness of the world is gathering in such a way that the believers in Jesus Christ are being sifted, and, and, and literally there is kind of a sifting or a, a gathering, a separation of, of the wheats and the tares in many ways. There, there, there are people who claim Christ, but when storms come, they ski daddle. That's a Hebrew word. They get mad at God, or they, just, or they realize that, man, it's not worth it. I could, I could really be ostracized, politicized, marginalized. Any other eyes do you want to do? But then there are those, and I, I, I choose to be here because the Lord says, pray that you're found worthy, worthy to escape the troubles of those days. <laughs> it's Luke chapter 21, verse 25 there, 23. And, and, and he says, pray that way. Why? Because there is darkness gathering, and yet by looking to Jesus Christ and being sold out fully to Jesus, we are more than conquerors. That's God's will. It's God's will. And the assembling of our, listen guys, 
Why do we come together? So we can have nice worship and just have fun together? No. This is a spiritual exercise, a battle, where we are coming together, encouraging one another, and especially being encouraged by the Holy Spirit so that we can go out and share freedom in Jesus with everyone and actually see it happen. And because there are strongholds and attacks against us, we need to come together and huddle together and say, in Jesus' name, go team. You can do it. Not because you're really, really good looking. We know, we know the Lord's will is for us to share the good news. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. So if you can't find anybody in your family to listen to you share the gospel, share the gospel with their pets in their presence <laughs> and do it out loud. Sometimes you got to make stuff up. Share Jesus with everyone. We know it is the will of the Lord for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Do not be drunk with wine, but as is the manner and custom of some. But be filled. It's not drunk. Don't be drunk with the Holy. That's not what it's saying. Don't be drunk with the Holy Spirit. That's just knuckleheadism. Be filled with the Spirit, which brings you to a place of I have the authority in the name of Jesus to cast down strongholds and to tread on serpents and scorpions in the name of Jesus. Because I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a pride thing. And it's not in your own power. It's because the Spirit of God dwells up with you. And, and maybe it is a moment of righteous indignation or anger. I hope you're not like me. <laughs> Volatile, that one. You know? But maybe in, in wisdom or gentleness, the Lord, you, or just a, a word, a word of power through the Holy Spirit that will bring deliverance to somebody. That's what the church does. That's the will of God for the church. We have become such namby-pamby. Not we, not you. Don't get mad at me. Uh, no, put the rocks down. No. I'm talking about the church as a whole. Man, I actually thought I would get to a sermon today. The Lord's will is for us to be ready. Now, that, that word, word appears in so many places. And so there are different meanings or reasons to be ready. One is this. Always be ready. Ready to give the reason for your faith. Now, it's not your faith, because faith, people have faith in, you know, hoogly moogly and the God over there and this God over there, and, and they have all kinds of, there's all kinds of faith. Don't talk about your faith. Talk about your faith in Jesus. You want to talk about power? It's your faith in Jesus. I have faith. Well, yeah, I have faith. I have the faith. I have faith that the Chiefs will win a football game. Well, big, hairy deal. Some people have faith in government. Boy, there's a mistake in faith. Or science. Whoa, that's just real dubious. You have faith in Jesus. Be ready at all times to share. Give, a, give an answer for the faith that is in you. In Christ Jesus. Be ready to stand firm. And resist the enemy. And resist the enemy in the name of Jesus. Resist the enemy. What will, what will he do? Eventually he's going to flee. It may not be immediate. Uh, please hear this newsflash. You know, you, you meet that mountain lion on the path and you say, I resist you mountain lion. What's he going to do? Rawr! You know, he's going to come at you and scream and holler. Stand fast. Ephesians chapter 6. Stand. Having done all to stand, stand. 
be ready at all times because the enemy is tricksy. Tricky. Be ready. Be ready. Paul says this. Be ready for the coming of the Lord so that you're not caught unaware like those who are not watching and for whom it will be like a thief in the night. But you are not of that persuasion. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter 5. That this would catch you like a thief in the night. But set your watch. Not, not this. Your what? Be ready. So here we are knowing that God's will is for us to be ready for a battle. Yes. To be ready to serve. To be ready to jump in the middle of the, the battle. To be ready for the Lord and His appearing and His blessed appearing. To be ready with all of those things. This is God's will for us. Just like God told Joshua, get up, arise. It's kind of a cool term that he uses. It's not like, you know, get off your duff. That's not what he's saying. It's it. Joshua has been wandering around for 40 years since the first, he was one of the first spies. Remember the 12 spies that went in and it was Joshua and Caleb who came back. The other 10 said, man, the land is beautiful just like God said, but there, are, there be giants there. We're like grasshoppers in their eyes. And by the way, they were, and there were giants, the Rephaim, the Zamzumim, all of these tribes of literally infested, demonically infested, DNA-changed human beings. That's what the Scripture talks about. It's not conspiracy theory. Genesis chapter 6. And they were to go up against something that was too big for them. And God said, yes, you're like grasshoppers in their eyes. He agreed with them. Yeah, you're, you're little guys compared to them. But I am with you. And Joshua and Caleb are leading the... Yes, let's go, let's go. We've come through the Red Sea. God parted the water, came from the rock and manna from the sky and quail, and we had everything provided for us. And we have the presence of God. Let me at him. That's Joshua and Caleb. But the people listened to the ten, and all of them ended up dying in the desert except Joshua and Caleb. Anybody under the, over the age of 20 ended up dying in the desert. Forty years they wondered. But Joshua and Caleb had given the good report saying, we can get them, we can get them, let us at them, we can do this. And now Joshua is ready and the moment has come. And the Lord, that's why the Lord says, arise, it's time, it's time. It's time to go, get the people, get across the river. I'm going to give you the city. It is God's will. It is God's will. It is God's will for this church to do what God is calling it to do. <laughs> Pure and simple. Pure and simple. And it's God's will for you to have victory in your life over the strongholds and the attacks and the things that are happening in your families. And, and all. It's God's will for you to live in victory, not in constant depression and fear and discouragement and beaten down. It's not God's will. It's God's will for you to hear right now, I am with you and I am going to take you through the fire, and it's not going to burn you, and the flood is not going to drown you. I'm going to take you through this. Get up and get moving. And that's God's will. That's what God, and I didn't get to the sermon. It's God's will for you to be saved. If you don't know Jesus, here's how it happens. You believe, the scripture says, you believe the gospel. The good news is that you and everyone else, myself included, we've all fallen short of God's glory. We've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And the wages of sin is death, which is separation. It's separation from God. But the grace of God is this. The free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we understand that God has done this for us through His Son, Jesus Christ, when He lived a sinless life, and He went to a cross and shed His blood. Scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. He did it. He shed His blood. And 
He rose again on the third day. Nobody does that. He did it. Because everything that he did and everything he said is true. And it was finished. And he rose from the dead. And if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth, this is a confession of him being your Lord. He's not just the Lord. Oh, yeah, the Lord's the Lord. Yeah, that's cool. I'm going to do my own thing. No, you're saying, I'm confessing him as the Lord. He, he is Lord. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. What's the scripture say? You will be saved. That's how you're saved. Receive the gift. To all who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. So if you don't know Jesus, now's the moment. Time is running out. It's time. The war is gathering. It's getting weirder and weirder. Deception is getting thicker and thicker. It's time to be on the Lord's side because he is about to rise up. So believe on the Lord Jesus. How many have a stronghold again? Now you say, yeah, it's time to get moving. Come on, raise your hand. I'm not looking. I don't care. The Lord cares. You got to acknowledge by faith, Lord, I need you in this situation because it's too big. Lord, you, you've seen the hands and you see the hearts right now. People are struggling with things. Father, we take authority over it in Jesus' name. And we engage this thing according to your terms. First of all, we claim you as our Lord and Savior. You are our God and we are your people. And the Spirit of God lives in us. And our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And we are covered by the blood of Jesus. And we are filled by the Spirit of God. And so, therefore, we can say with a surety, we are God's children. And so, Lord, we speak to these Jericho walls that are before us, and we say, in Jesus' name, you are coming down. You are coming down. That impossible situation, that weighty situation, that burdensome situation, we say, in Jesus' name, your day is coming. You are coming down. And now, Lord, Begin to lead us in the way that we should go. If it's circling the walls seven times, seven days, and then seven times in a day, if that's what the call is, we will obey. We first of all say, Lord, here's my life. The things that are in it that are not right, I pledge to make right. And I look to you as my sanctifier and my Lord. The walls are coming down. Say it with me. The walls are coming down in Jesus' name. Stand with me. Praise God. Wow. Man, this whole service from start to finish has been about this, and we didn't plan that. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You know what? That, that is who he is. He's our way maker. How many are believing right now God's going to make a way? Now, come on. This is a statement of faith in him. Say this with me. I can do all things, even get stuff right. In, in the name of Jesus, through him who strengthens me. Now, the verse is this, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We just added some stuff, right? Let that be our theme today. God bless you. Have an awesome day. Have an awesome day.